Hello everyone, welcome back to Z Physics. Today we're going to be talking about X-ray attenuation mechanisms. The mechanisms that we're going to be looking in this video are simple scatter, and then straight after that we'll look into Compton scattering, pair production, and finally the photoelectric effect. Okay, well, let's start off with simple scattering. So imagine that we have a nucleus, as I've illustrated over here, with a surrounding electron. So this could be a hydrogen atom, for instance, or it could be a, could be a different one. Um, the diagram is, of course, not drawn to scale, but I just wanted to visualize this. And additionally, the nucleus as well doesn't have uh, a smiley face sort of drawn on top of it, but because it's positive, I decided to put one in. Anyways, back to simple scattering. Now, this occurs when we have an incoming X-ray. So let's draw that. So imagine this over here is our X-ray. If our X-ray doesn't have enough energy to ionize this atom, it does not have enough energy to remove this electron. What simply happens is that the X-ray is actually scattered. So this means that the X-ray is going to change its direction. It's going to just scatter off this electron. The electron's um, energy state will be most likely completely unchanged and um, in general this does not happen uh, very often. In medical physics when we're producing x-rays they tend to have a they tend to have a lot more energy so the simple scatter is almost an insignificant portion of the ways that x-rays interact with matter. Okay, now let's have a look if we were to raise the energy of the x-ray a little bit. The next possible x-ray attenuation mechanism that we are going to be looking at is known as Compton scattering. If the incoming x-ray has a high energy, higher than what is required to remove an electron, first off, an electron is going to be removed. So this electron that was once here is going to be removed. So we can just say here that the electron is removed on our diagram. However, there is still some excess energy within the X-ray. So it does not disappear completely and instead it is scattered with lower energy. And this is why I will actually draw it with red. So this is the uh, scattered X-ray with lower energy. The reason why I've drawn it uh, this with red is because red in general has a lower energy, a longer wavelength. That's where the term redshift comes from. But once again, Compton scattering, the X-ray has more than enough energy to remove the electron. The electron is removed. There's still some energy left into the system. And there is a scattered photon with less energy, with a higher wavelength, with a lower frequency. Next mechanism that we're going to be looking at is one of the most interesting ones and is known as pair production. Now, if the incoming X-ray has sufficiently high energy and interacts in particular with the nucleus of the atom, an electron-positron pair is produced. So this is really amazing. The X-ray after that interaction can literally turn into a pair of opposite particles of matter and antimatter. So we could have, let's say, a positron going this way. I'm going to give that with an E plus, which is a positron. Let's write this in brackets. And we could also have another one going the opposite way, which is just our standard electron. And this over here is an electron. Now normally those two particles are going to annihilate each other immediately after they have been produced or very very shortly afterwards and they will produce a pair of lower energy 
photons that your detector in the lab, for instance, can, uh, can detect. So um, this is one of the most common ways of actually identifying the types of radiation that have, um, that have struck or have, or have been emitted from a radioactive substance, for instance, which has many interesting applications. Now, we could actually calculate the minimum energy of an incoming X-ray photon. And if we wanted to, we could also calculate the minimum wavelength or the frequency. Well, let's do this. We know that the energy delta E is that, let's say that's the energy of the photons, will have to be equal to delta MC squared. Now, our change in mass in this scenario, because we're getting a pair of electrons, uh, sorry, a pair of electron and a positron, will actually be equal to two times the mass of an electron, because a positron and electron have the same mass. So it's going to be twice times 9.11 times 10 to the power of minus 31. Our factor of c squared is, of course, 3.0 times 10 to the 8, and all of this is squared. And if we were to plug this into a scientific calculator, we are going to get approximately 1.6 multiplied by 10 to the power of minus 13 joules. Quite often in medical physics, we tend to work in electron volts. So if this over here is uh, my energy, uh, we can convert that to electron volts or mega electron volts. So what I'm going to do is take that number 1.6 times 10 to the power of minus 13 and then I'm going to divide that by the electron charge. So that's 1.6 times 10 to the power of minus 19. This means that, of course, I'm going to get approximately 1.0. If I included a bit more significance on here, I think I'm going to get approximately 1.2 times 10 to the power of 6 electron volts, which is approximately equal to 1 mega electron volt. So this number is actually really, really important. This is the minimum energy of an, of, uh, of an incoming X-ray photon for a pair production to occur. We could even take this a step further and we can calculate the, um, the wavelength of this uh, X-ray photon. Let's do this one over here on the side. So what I'm going to set is, it, what I'm going to do is set that energy to be HC over lambda. And then I'm going to rearrange for lambda. So lambda will be HC and divided by E, like so. Plugging in some numbers, this will be H Planck's constant 6.63 times 10 to the power of minus 34, multiplied by the speed of light, which is 3.0 times 10 to the power of 8. Our energy in joules was approximately 1.6 times 10 to the power of minus 13 joules. And if we were to plug this into a calculator, uh, we're going to get about 1.2 times 10 to the power of minus 12 meters. And this is the minimum wavelength required for, um, for an incoming X-ray to have for pair production to occur. Once again, this X-ray that is going towards the nucleus is going to interact with it and then it's going to split into an electron positron pair and the energy of that can be calculated using delta E equal to delta mc squared, and the minimum wavelength as well. If we wanted to, we could calculate the wavelength of the photons that are going to be emitted after the electrons and the positrons have interacted. That's just going to be half of that value because they're going to have half the energy each. One final really important aspect that we need to consider is that both energy and momentum are conserved in this interaction.
There are two particles which are being produced from the X-ray, an electron and a positron traveling in opposite directions because momentum has to be conserved. It is a vector quantity. So initially this horizontal momentum over here was, uh, was zero because the particle was just traveling towards the nucleus. So it has to be zero in this direction after the event as well, which is why they're traveling at opposite in opposite directions. The final mechanism that we're going to be looking at today is the good old photoelectric effect. Now with the photoelectric effect, the X-ray is entirely absorbed by the electron. So this means that we have an incoming X-ray like so, and this X-ray disappears. Straight after the event, it's no longer there. What we do have, however, is an electron which is now moving with a certain velocity and it has some kinetic energy that's been taken directly from that event, directly from the X-ray energy. Now during this event, once again, the X-ray is absorbed and then the electron is released with some kinetic energy. Of course, the X-ray has to have significantly high enough energy, has to be higher than the work function for this to happen. Okay, folks, so hopefully this makes sense. Let me know if there are any questions. Hope this online lesson on X-ray attenuation mechanisms was useful and good luck with your revision.